Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, two seconds. Jeff Cassidy, he's a digital design engineer at Kepler Communications, and uh, I'll just speak to his short. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, two seconds. All right, uh, so just to give you the really quick high level overview, um, Kepler is a startup based here in Toronto. Uh, we're at Sudan and Queen, basically. Uh, looking to provide low-cost global telecom using and, uh, uh, actually a full-scale model that's one of the two satellites that we have in orbit. Um, and we've got a third one on deck to go in the last half of this year. Uh, so the way I'll structure the talk here is I'll cover a few basics of satellite communications, small satellites, orbits, and sort of different pros and cons there. Uh, well, I'll talk about what's interesting to this group, which is the FPGA software defined radio, which is one of the crucial technologies that lets us do what we do in the size of the tower that we have. Uh, and then I will talk a little bit about Kepler and um, the fact that we are hiring or looking for a large number of people following our successful Series A financing uh, in the fall. So, uh, Earth orbits are generally divided into low, <laughs> medium, and geostationary. Low is uh, in the sort of hundreds of kilometers range. Medium is in between that and geostationary. Geostationary is 35,000 kilometers up. Traditionally, most satellite communication has been in the geostationary band. The reason being that um, at that altitude, the satellite orbits at the same rate as the Earth. And so you can actually just point your dish at a fixed point in the sky and maintain communication with the satellite, which is not really acceptable for real-time connectivity. Uh, medium Earth orbit, the MEO zone, is inhabited by other satellites, including GPS. And there's been a lot of interest lately in low Earth orbit, what we call LEO, because you can launch them much less expensively. The round trip latencies are a lot lower, 15 milliseconds. And in fact, it's conceptually possible to transmit signals via LEOSAT faster across the ocean than it is using fiber, because fiber has a refractive index, whereas in space, you're transmitting through vacuum. <clears throat> so there's a little animation. Uh, one of the interesting things about low Earth orbit, um, which I should mention is also inhabited by the International Space Station, uh, you complete an orbit every 90 minutes. And so a given satellite is whizzing overhead. And one of the benefits of GEO, of course, a single satellite can cover nearly a hemisphere of the Earth, whereas in LEO, not only do you have to steer your satellite or your, uh, your dish, um, but you also need a constellation of satellites if you want to provide global coverage. So just to give you an idea of the size of satellites and, and what we're talking about, this is a GPS Block 3A satellite by Lockheed Martin. Uh, it's a little bit over 4,000 kilograms. Um, I think it's about 4 kilowatts of power. Um, you can see it's the size of a small bus. Very expensive to develop, very expensive to launch, but decades of service lights. Um, this is an Iridium Next. So Iridium is a constellation of satellites that provides uh, voice and low rate data. Uh, that's about 700 kilograms, correspondingly less power, slightly less expensive to develop and launch, uh, but still quite pricey. And then of recent interest, there's been this whole division of small satellites, which is under 500 kilograms, uh, including nano satellites such as our, our model here, KIP. This is satellites that are one to 10 kilograms. They are really cheap to build, really cheap to launch. And so it's an interesting technology uh, trade-off in that we're not designing something that has to last for 20 years. And also, because we're continuously refreshing in our concept, uh, you can incorporate the latest and greatest technology. So all the advances of digital, analog technology, uh, satellite technology, can make it into the constellation very, very quickly. Um, it also provides a ton of different launch options. So there's a very active commercial market now in space launch services. It's no longer government only. It's no longer hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, it's fairly cheap and easy to get things up there in orbit. So we are, compared to the digital <coughs> geosats, about 100 times smaller, 100 times cheaper, 100 times less power, less mass. So we're doing all of this on tens of watts of peak power when we're transmitting at, at full power. So 
one of the interesting things about space is mass is incredibly important, right? Because every kilogram of satellite requires many, many kilograms of rocket fuel to get it up in orbit. And so one of the interesting analyses that our marketing team has done is looking at throughput per mass, so megabits per second per kilogram. And you can see out on the right here, our nanosatellites do a lot more traffic per kilogram than traditional providers. So, um, so like Imarsat, Intelsat, uh, Intelsat is geosatellites. Um, and then there's O3B networks, which is aiming to do uh, Leosat via SmallSat. Um, and you can see that our, our throughput is far in excess of those. Uh, at the same time, we've seen an explosion in the number of satellites being launched. So to date, I should say, um, for launch over the next number of years, 17,000 satellites between Kepler, um, obviously SpaceX, OneWeb, um, a bunch of other companies. So you can see the sort of exponential growth there. It's a very exciting time to be working in space. There's what used to be decades of schedule, hundreds of millions of budget, and a very small number of players is now a very active market with a lot of people doing things. So one of the drivers of that is the development of the CubeSat standard. How many people have heard of CubeSats? What happens? It's pretty good. Um, so basically, it's a the standard cube, one U, is 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters, uh, and depending on which exact variant you go with, you know, one and a third kilograms or, or just slightly more mass. And then you have standard satellites that are basically just box configurations. So that's a 3U satellite right there, 10 by 10 by 30. And what that standardization does for you is it enables uh, vendors to come into the market and have a standard product offer. So you can actually pick parts off the shelf, um, you know, be it battery, attitude control, et cetera. And when it comes to launch and deployment, obviously qualifying hardware for space is not easy or cheap. And so it allows vendors um, like the uh, Innovative Solutions in Space, which has the unfortunate acronym ISIS for these days. <laughs> um, Try explaining that on an export control form vendor basis. <laughs> um, it allows them to produce standard offerings. So they have space qualified deployers. And so a, a larger satellite that's being launched, you basically strap on one of these deployers, load it up with CubeSats, and then just kind of pop them out once it's in orbit. And that's how we get our ride to space. Uh, and this is all due to increased, of course, commercial interest in space. So there are now actually standard price lists posted. It used to be, you know, call us and we'll tell you some astronomical amount of money that it will cost, and we'll need a few providers. And now there are a number of different ways to get your small side of the So what actually fits in that package right over there? Um, there's a KU band antenna array. I'll get into exactly what KU band means and what the trade-offs are in a minute. And um, at least from my very biased perspective, the heart of the thing is a software-defined radio. Right? So we've got a little board stack there with an FPGA on it. Um, analog front end, very supporting stuff. And then the other things that all have to fit in that little chassis, we've got solar panels that uh, fold out um, post-launch. There's a battery on board. Uh, we've got attitude control. There's a management computer that handles the FPGA images and the power bus and such. And we fit that all into a very small form factor there. <clears throat> so uh, getting into the part that is most of interest to this group here, FPGA software defined radio. <clears throat> so uh, communications 101, for those who maybe need a refresher for their undergrad. Um, you have a radio wave, so you're, you're modulating an electric field in time, um, and you impose changes on that carrier to convey information. So you can change the amplitude, the phase, the frequency. Right? And you have a certain bandwidth over which you operate. That bandwidth is highly regulated because when you transmit with a, with a device, be it a satellite or a land-based system, there's a potential for you to interfere with other users of the spectrum. And so uh, national organizations grant licenses for portions of spectrum at particular locations, transmit powers, et cetera. And you can see here uh, from this Industry Canada uh, depiction, it's, uh, it's a reasonably crowded space. It's actually a very valuable commodity that uh, companies buy and sell. So the, the range of frequencies, uh, as denoted by the IEEE, is shown here. We've opted to use the KU band, and our actually first KU band nano satellite out there. And uh, among the reasons for that, 
the higher frequency uh, will cause a lower wavelength, and so all the sizes of things like antennas get smaller, and also just the sheer availability of spectrum. Right? A megahertz of spectrum is a megahertz of spectrum. KU band is four gigahertz of spectrum in that band, uh, and we have worldwide licenses for a, for a very decent chunk of it. Uh, the other thing I should mention with, uh, with wavelength, of course, is the smaller you get in wavelength, the more directional your signal is. So it's hard to get a directional signal with a, with a really long wavelength. The shorter you go, the easier it is to get a directional signal. That's why we have to. All right. So for digital communication, we're interested in sending data here. Um, obviously, we're going to have discrete possibilities for the state of the carriers placed in. I've got a couple of more common ones here, so binary phase shift keying, you're either transmitting a positive carrier or a negative. Um, you can throw in additional states. And basically what ends up happening is the number of times per second that your carrier state changes is called your symbol rate. And then if you multiply the symbol rate by the number of bits per symbol, you get a data rate. So obviously for a given symbol rate, 8 PSK will transmit more information, 3 bits per symbol, than 3 PSK F1. And that symbol rate is going to determine how much bandwidth you require to transmit that signal. So, a basic wireless receiver, without wanting to get too far into the details, um, you have what's called a mixer stage. So, your antenna measures a very, very tiny change in the electric field. Uh, it goes through a bandpass filter and an amplifier, so you, you select out a portion of the spectrum. It goes to a mixer, uh, which is the, the multiplier symbol there. And that will convert the frequency down. So we would have signal coming in at say 12 gigahertz and a, a small band around that. That will get converted down into the L band, which is about one to two gigahertz, um, further amplified. And then you feed it into a phase lock loop. So the phase lock loop will essentially try, it's a control system that will try to reduce the difference between the carrier frequency. Um, and the local oscillator frequency so that we have a local exact copy of what the transmitter, uh, what the transmitter's carrier wave is. <clears throat> and then from there, once we have a local exact copy of, or as exact as we can, copy of that carrier wave, we can compare the, the, the carrier wave with what we're receiving and we can see how it can modify it. And so the first part of that is detecting where the symbol edge falls. So if you have a base, apologies on the clarity of that figure there. Uh, if you have a baseband signal that looks like that, which is a very common waveform if you don't have a lot of noise, um, you want to find where the symbol is in time. So you can see there we found that peak, and then you can decide, okay, well, what bits does this symbol represent? And then uh, with wireless communication, with wireless communication, um, you typically have fairly high bit error rates. You're usually constrained by power and bandwidth, you want to push as much data as you can. And so you're operating very, very close um, to the limit of what you can actually detect. So you typically, in the incoming data stream at least, have a very, very high bit error rate. So when I say high, I mean it could be 5%, could be 10% under certain operating conditions. So to make this into a do, exceedingly well. And it is actually one of the larger blocks in our design. Oops, right here. And then lastly, you deframe the signal and uh, send the packet out to whoever's consuming it. All right. So software-defined radio basically means pushing absolutely as much of this flow as possible into software. And so why would we want to do that? Well, when you're dealing with digital domain, every operation is linear, so long as you want it to be, of course, right? So addition and multiplication are, are perfect. Um, dynamic range is however many bits you want to allocate. It's reconfigurable, which is a word I don't need to introduce, of course, to this audience. So you can change up what you're doing at any time. And the only noise that you have to deal with once you're in the digital domain is what was on the incoming signals, plus any round off error, which is under your control. Now, there is still part of this done in the analog domain, and the reason for that is power. Right? If we're operating at 12 gigahertz, that's a rather insane sample rate at which you can even try and operate a device, right? And that's why we continue to do the bare minimum of operations in the analog front end. Right? If we only need to digitize a couple hundred megahertz around um, our carrier at 12 gig, then uh, we can down convert it in the analog domain, which is very cheap in terms of power. Not an easy design to do. Um, not something I'm 
looking familiar with, but uh, certainly tricky to get right. And then you can digitize at a reasonable sample rate, like hundreds of megahertz or 500 megahertz. Right? And of course, in the analog domain, everything is noisy, everything is nonlinear, um, and everything has kind of limited operating parameters. Right? So, uh, existing solutions for software defined radio. Um, there's a really good open source package that we use called GNU Radio, which uh, is written in C and Python, allows you to graphically connect blocks together, and so it actually provides a lot of the common blocks. We're using that as a reference for a lot of uh, a lot of our designs, and there are even parts of our existing ground control system that use GNU Radio for analysis. Um, part of what I've done since joining Kepler is I've built a software system that connects GNU Radio to model sim, so you can actually have a block in GNU Radio that will accept or produce samples uh, and bridge that over to model sim. So you can lay out a pipeline, simulate it, put it through various channel conditions, model that, and so on, and you can actually start moving blocks one by one into FPGA simulations. That was a kind of a fun piece of development. Um, and that way you, you have an accepted reference that people out there have actually used. Um, and then if you if you want a hardware test bed, there is a company called Edis Research that uh, actually creates um, devices so they have the converters on board and then you can program the FPGA to do the processing. Um, the approximate power levels, the sensitivity, the amount of noise we're going to deal with, directivity, the bandwidth. And all the converters. But once we get into the digital domain, all this stuff is up for grabs and it can be reprogrammed at will. So, some of the things that we can and have done with that, we can upgrade on orbit. So, if we write better code that can handle a higher symbol rate, do more clever processing, consume less power, and so on, we have a mechanism whereby we can actually upload that image, schedule the satellite to run it, and then um, test it out and see what happens. And then, of course, the onboard computer will fall back if something goes wrong. If the FPGA fails to configure, if it fails to make contact with the ground in a certain amount of time, etc., it will resort back to a manual image. Uh, it also permits on-orbit testing of new code. So I'm currently working on a, a new radio design for a low data rate control radio. Well, because the analog front end is common, I can actually send live signals up to the satellite with an image up there and see is my code working or not. Um, from a commercial point of view, reconfigurability also allows us to respond to changing customer needs. And so you can program in different images, uh, the duration of a pass. The satellite takes plus or minus 10 minutes to pass overhead. That's the window that a given ground location has to communicate with it. Um, you can load in a different configuration there. Over the long term, if somebody decides that they don't like standard X, we need to develop some IP, but then we send it up there, and as long as it's using the same band, it's good to go. Uh, we can address different markets. So we can have an image that works for IoT, so extremely low power, extremely low data rate, uh, or our high data rate signal. And uh, we have actually done this business model as well, in which it's essentially rent a satellite. So we, we are given a module by a customer, integrated into the satellite, and then basically send it up there let it run, downlink their data, and then uh, you do that. And that's all, of course, enabled by the FPGA. The traditional approach has been ASIC and analog, which means that you're stuck with whatever's up there. Uh, so I'll give examples of two of the applications that we currently run. Um, so the first one is DDBS2, that's Digital Video Broadcast Satellite Generation 2. So this is a well-established standard. Um, if you ever see a CDC news truck, driving around, uh, uh, or more so parked with their the dish facing upwards, they're probably using DVBS2 to, to link that data. And it's basically a way to transfer Ethernet frames. Um, there are a whole bunch of modulation and error coding standards, so you can do anything from quad phase shift keying, so two, bit, two bits per symbol, um, with, uh, with an error code that actually encodes a whole bunch of redundant data, up to uh, 32 APSK. So 32 different configurations of amplitude and phase. Um, so what we're doing in customer demos of this right now is using a, an Intellium dish there, um, 65 centimeters, and that gives us a uh, pretty decent data rate. We're seeing tens of megabits in customer installs. Uh, so recently, DVB S2X extensions came along, and the great news here is, of course, still using the same bandwidth, we can just put in a new image, and suddenly we support 
you know, new extensions. And so you can do higher data rates by changing the constellation. You can do lower data rates uh, that have been defined for low signal to noise or for small antennas. Um, and that's all a matter of just changing the FPGA code and testing it out. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit. I think it's, it's interesting. It's something I didn't know a lot about before joining Kepler. Um, it's certainly one of the one of the bigger IP blocks that we use is uh, forward error correction. So as I said earlier, we're operating in a regime where potentially five or ten percent of bits that we receive are corrupted, and yet we want to receive Ethernet frames with a very high probability of correctness. So we employ redundant bits, um, and you, the code rate is basically the fraction of bits that are useful. So common setup will be anywhere from a half to nine tenths, let's say, of your bits are. Message and then the rest are a parity check. Um, so, in the simplest incarnation, like a CRC, you simply have a mechanism for knowing if you got the message correctly or not. LDPC is better than that in that it will actually use the redundant information to correct the frame. It's also used quite often in optical communications um, where the bit rates can be even more massive and it has to be done by ASA. <clears throat> So uh, the two options there are hard to code. So you basically see what is the minimum number of bit flips that I have to do to my received message to get a message that passes parity check. And the alternative is what's called a soft decode, which is the, the message most the, the legitimate message most probable given the message you receive. So if the message you receive doesn't pass parity, you find the uh, most probable alternative. And so each of those, instead of being a one or a zero, you decide well. Definitely a one, definitely a one, maybe a zero, no idea what that one is. Uh, so it's lock based. We, we operate there on um, per GBBS2 standard uh, 64 k bit information blocks, um, which may which of which a certain fraction are, uh, are information and the rest are parity. And the decoding process, uh, which is very amenable to FPGAs, is basically in parallel. You compute the parity check. So the, the message bits that we think we have are up top here. The blue arrows indicate those message bits contribute to a certain parity check. And so you evaluate in parallel all these thousands and thousands of parity checks. You see which ones pass and which ones don't. And essentially each parity check that fails says that, well, one at least one of the nodes feeding me is incorrect. And then you look and you, you make a decision. So if you have you know, if you have a single bit error in your, in your received message, every single parity check node fed by that bit would be wrong. And you'll look and you'll say, well, there's only one thing in common with this, which is that message bit. So flip that message bit and then pass. Um, so this is quite um, intensive. Uh, it's usually done iteratively using the loop propagation. Um, because the actual full solution is an NP complete problem with a space of. 32,400 bits. That's a very large number of possible uh, solutions to compute there. <clears throat> All right, so that's, a, that's how our high data rate radio works. Um, basically transmitting tens or hundreds of megabits a second using the 12 month standard. Uh, we are also looking at low data rate radios with things like uh, what's called TPC, tracking telemetry and control, uh, as well as to address needs in the Internet of Things market. So things where you might only want a few, say, 100 byte messages a day from something that's, that's sitting out in the field somewhere powered by a pool of batteries. So um, proven a number of decades ago, uh, there's a minimum energy per bit that's required to communicate reliably over a noisy channel. And so basically that energy per bit times the data rate you're choosing is the power that has to be deployed to transmit. Right? At the same time, though, um, Nyquist's theorem says that essentially the symbol rate determines the bandwidth. Right? And so if we want to sustain a given uh, data rate, and the energy and the uh, bits per symbol can only go as low as one, we actually um, have a problem here where we, we can't choose certain combinations because we can't choose modulation that's less than one bit per symbol. Um, which in the IoT case, where you may have a very tiny terminal with a very tiny antenna transmitting very little power, might not uh, meet your spec. So what we're working on doing, this is most of my time right now at work, um, is looking at spread spectrum. Right? So what you can do is you take your signal and you 
spread it, so it takes an artificially large bandwidth compared to the, the actual data rate that you want to send, and then you spread the power over all that bandwidth or over all that time, and it can then be received cleanly at the end. So one of the things that we're doing with that um, in, the, in the KU band, so one of the regulatory uh, wrinkles of the KU band is that it's used for uh, geostationary satellites. And so you have a geostationary satellite here, and our satellite whizzes between it and the ground, and we're transmitting, and they're transmitting, and we can interfere with each other, and so that's not allowed. Um, so when the, when the spacecraft has knowledge of where it is, it can simply just back off or even shut off the transmitter, but for a, a tracking and control radio, we don't have that option necessarily. And so there's a fairly strict limit on the amount of emitted power called EPFD, equivalent power flux density, that basically says, Thou shalt not emit more than this amount of power per bandwidth um, as received at the surface of the Earth. And so there's another rule, of course, that says you should have your tracking and control in the same band as your service. And so we want to offer KU that service, we should have KU to see. Um, so we end up having this problem where even using the sort of the minimum signal encoding complexity, we would be emitting way too much power to receive at this dish, um, and we'd be violating this, this EPFD limit. And so the solution that we're taking to that is spread spectrum. So if you take that same power and you spread it out, you now no longer violate the requirement because the, the requirement's expressed as power to 40 k band. Okay? So what that looks like is this. Um, and this is widely used. G uh, CDMA Cellular does this. This is how they separate channels. Um, GPS also uses spread sets. Ah, spread spectrum for noise immunity and for distinguishing between satellites. So there's plenty of technology here. And what you do is you essentially artificially introduce transitions into your signal. So if I want to transmit the message down at the bottom in red, um, I have a known pseudo-random sequence. So if I, if I know the generating polynomial and I know the state at a given time, I can, I can replicate the bits at will. Uh, and what I do is I simply XOR the message I want to send with the PN sequence. And what that will do is create a signal that has a much higher bandwidth. Right? It's got a lot more transitions in it. And what that actually ends up looking like in practice, um, this is basically what our, what our TTNC ground station is going to see. That is the magnitude of our signal, and then the noise and interference is the panel on the right. So it's a little promising for demodulation, but actually with spread, spread spectrum, it is possible. Um, and the reason is that the way the signal is spread is structured. Whereas the noise and interference are, of course, essentially unstructured. So when I apply that sequence in reverse, um, the noise being uncorrelated with the sequence will tend to integrate to zero as per normal, and I'm effectively averaging over a number of samples, uh, but the signal will actually integrate to a larger value. It's called process noise. So the neat thing about this is this is operating on the same analog front end converter and FPGA as our 300 megabit per second uh, DBBS2 core, and yet we're operating at totally different power spectral density, totally different modulation parameters, etc. We can switch between these or have them share an FPGA with um, configurability. So uh, yeah, the only the only cost to that is of course. If you're spreading by a factor of s, you now need to process s times more samples. So if I wanted to do, you know, say a megabit, right, and I spread it by a factor of 20, well now I have 20 megahertz of bandwidth that I need to digitize the process. Where unspread, I can get away with doing only one. But of course, today's FPGAs have enough DSP and they operate fast enough. This is not a material challenge. Um, and in fact, for the low data rate design, we're looking at probably hundreds of milliwatts for the total logic in the DSP, which is far, far less than the actual analog transmit power. Okay. Uh, so that is what we do. I'm just going to talk a little bit about Kepler, and uh, we'll get to the punchline and the pizza momentarily. So this is uh, the most recent team photo that we have. It's actually in our old office. We now have uh, three floors um, at uh, a building at uh, Clean and Spadina, essentially. So found in 2015, uh, C round 2016, Series A 2018. Um, I was when I joined, I was absolutely blown away that the company had gone from seed financing to satellite in orbit in something like a year and a half, um, which is I think pretty remarkable. 
Uh, we're now at $21 million USD of, uh, of total capital raised, and we're looking to approximately double the size. <clears throat> the overall mission is uh, to put the internet in space, the phrase we like to use. So essentially looking at the massive number of satellites being launched and all the interesting things that are going on in space in terms of um, yeah, different sensing missions and, and the future plans of you know, habitable environments in space, mining in space, etc. We're looking at building a sort of internet backbone as our ultimate vision there, where we would have the radio IP, the satellite operation experience, um, the launch capabilities, etc in place so that if you wanted to launch a satellite mission, you would not need to build your own ground station, build your own radio, etc. You could buy a module, buy services, and then Kepler would be your backbone, essentially. Um, so what are we doing now on the way to that? Well, uh, we have wideband and narrowband services that we're demoing. So the, the high data rate, tens of hundreds of megabits, depending on what your satellite dish is. Um, we're working on very low data rate, very low power stuff. We have Two satellites in service now, uh, third one slated to go up uh, in the latter half of the year. And uh, our last round of funding should take us to a constellation of 15 satellites, which is getting us closer to um, real-time connectivity. So every satellite we launch reduces the latency from currently five and a half hours um, to much less. What we're demoing right now to customers is a storage forward service. So essentially you have a mobile platform anywhere on Earth, satellite dish, uh, you essentially drop data into a sort of drop box. When the satellite passes overhead, the data is uplinked, stored on an SSD on the satellite. As the satellite passes over one of our gateways, it's downlinked at hundreds of megabits per second and then made available to the end user. <clears throat> That's what it looks like, the uh, 3D satellite there. Our next one called TARS, if anyone's seen Interstellar. Um, That's where the names come from. <clears throat> I had to watch it after joining just to understand. TARS will be a 6U CubeSat, so twice as large, um, and it will basically contain all of the technology that we have in KIP, as well as uh, some additional S band low data rate. Uh, so, our long term timeline here uh, we're looking at 10 to 15 satellites in the next couple of years. Um, we'll start looking at inter satellite links, so the satellites can communicate with each other instead of just a gateway. Um, next generation after that is going to be multiple beam with a phased array. So by basically uh, forming linear combinations of the signals from different antennas, you can form a beam that is more sensitive to one spot versus another. And then ultimately, high data rate with your satellite links a couple of years out. So there's the punchline. Uh, we are hiring, looking to double in size in the next year, various capacities. Um, so please do check us out, Kepler.space. Uh, and of course, I'm happy to field any queries about the company, the technology, working there, etc. Pizza should be coming up soon, I think. Uh, hopefully Paul is uh, off to get that. Be happy to take questions. A number of small staff providers are using standard FPGAs. Um, there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, one is the radiation environment in low Earth orbit is far more benign than in NEO and GEO, just the nature of the Earth's magnetic field where the charged particles are. So other than in the southern Atlantic anomaly, which is basically a... Um, and so the, the idea there is it's essentially low cost slash free to just reboot the satellite when it needs doing. Um, we've had a satellite in orbit operating for a year, uh, haven't seen significant operational anomalies on it. Um, in terms of like permanent damage, uh, FPGAs, I understand, are fairly resistant to latch up just intrinsically. So um, the worst that could happen would be a configuration bit gets scrambled, the FPGA does something absolutely crazy. Um, but then there's a, a config scrubber that will tell you that and you could have a chance to reboot it. So, um, it's not a huge problem. You said there's also a microcontroller that's that's um, reprogramming the FPGA. Is that for them? Yes, uh, that is very very much hard. So it's it's going at you know just clock speeds, and that's a that's a part that we buy. So there's a, a vendor who specializes in those systems for space because yeah, obviously when you're programming the FPGA, uh, if it gets scrambled even for an instant, not good. How big is the FPGA to use? Like large, uh, Q-Tech 7 right now, in orbit, uh, moving to ultrascale. Uh, ultrascale, isn't it? Um, it's actually, it doesn't 
would be that large. I'm not using the, the feeder of the panel. Um, because, I mean, what we have there is big enough, and also uh, we are quite power constrained. One of the interesting facts about space, actually, it, it's, um, it's equally disposing of heat. Um, that's a problem compared to with solar generation because, of course, you're in a vacuum. So radiative cooling is all you have for getting rid of all that heat. Um, so we need to we need to be very conscious of power. We sold solar power. We sold solar power. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, solar power plus battery. So. I actually have no idea. How fast does it need to run to get to the system clock speed? Um, so it depends on the part. So there are parts of it that are running at sample rate, so like 500 meg. Um, that's primarily like feed forward DSP, so you know, hard blocks, you can kind of make hard blocks. But, um, most of the system bus is like uh, 100 megahertz ish, not, uh, not too aggressive. Sure. So one more question. Sure. What, what um, resources do you use the most on the DSP for lots of memory? Like, what's the limiting factor? Yeah. Um, we're actually we're only at about three quarters, so I, I can't really say anything that's, that's limiting at the moment. Um, in terms of the ratio, uh, I've actually been focusing on one module, so I don't have the, the stats on it. We get a decent number of FPGAs. Uh, but I think it's actually fairly balanced. Yeah. Um, I perhaps I'm outside of what your company is concerned with, but. Um, mm -hmm. You talked about you switching your uh, your SATs or sorry your radios uh, on your SATs to uh, phase the way. Could you see the same thing happening on the ground starting to have a bridge to do that? Um, and basically if you switch to a phase the way, would the ground receiver also process that data with an FPGA? Uh, so yes, but the ground receiver is processing an FPGA. Um, I don't know that it's clear which way it's best. I think I would assume that in the long haul, electrically phased array will be the way it'll go. Um, those are still not cheap and not uh, simple. But we do have uh, we do have one company we're working with that does a flat panel about yay big and we've been able to talk to the satellite a little bit. Yeah. So this uh, nanosat model probably the same, you know, fast, easy, cheap, a quick turnaround, easily replaceable model. Um, what steps have you, if any, for responsible disposal and uh, super typical or normal self adjusting methods? That graph is scary. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is actually a huge topic of discussion. So um, uh, when we got our FCC market access order last fall, uh, this was one of the big items discussed. You are putting up 17,000 satellites with an orbital lifetime in years. Yes, they do fall down eventually. Well, that's good. Uh, that's my question though. how do you make sure they fall down? Uh, they do fall down. It's just a property of, of low Earth orbit. Oh, so there is there's just a system. little okay. tiny bit of atmosphere. Sure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> in case you missed it, much is on us. <laughs> Everyone is hearing great. I think we've got it.